Hello everybody, this is Serpent, and in this video I'm going to show you how the execute command works. First I'll tell you what it does, and then I'll go into the details about the individual subcommands. I'll also have chapter timestamps in the description, so you should be able to navigate around pretty easily to find what you're interested in. So when you run a command, either by typing it into a command block and running it there, or by running it in chat, the command assumes some information about the context in which it's run, and that's called the command context. So that contains the entity running the command, as well as the position and the rotation of the entity and the dimension it's in. And what the execute command does is it modifies the command context for which the command is being run. And you can also use the execute command to run multiple instances of the same command on a whole bunch of different contexts. The way the execute command does these things is by giving it a set of subcommands. So you start out always with slash execute, execute, and then you have a set of options here. So there are four types of subcommands. There are modify subcommands, storage subcommands, conditional, and run. The modify subcommands alter the command context. The storage subcommands can store the result of the command execution in some form of data, either block or entity or command block storage. And the run subcommand is used to run some other command, and it terminates the execution. And I should note that these subcommands are evaluated from left to right, so from the start of the command to the end. And if you reach a conditional that terminates the execution, then the commands following that will not be run. The, the subcommands following that will not be run. With that information out of the way, it's time to get on to the first subcommand. So this one is align, and it will align the command context's position, not its rotation, to one of the axes you supply. So the way this works is, let's type in execute, this starts the whole process, and we use align, and the argument that follows the align keyword is some combination of the characters x, y, and z. And they don't have to be in order, but these are the axes on which your coordinates, or the coordinates of the command context, are going to be rounded down. So it's a flooring of the given coordinates. So now that we've used align, we can run a teleportation command, and I will use my current coordinates as the starting position, and then offset by 0.5 to get to the center of the block, and there we go, right into the center. So this, as you can see, is aligning my coordinates. Next up is anchored, and this can be used to set the center of relative coordinates to be either your feet or your eyes. So let's demonstrate this with a use of set block. So if I type set block and use the relative to look coordinates, and let's say uh, two blocks forward, let's place a glass block. Oh, that didn't that didn't work very well, did it? So the relative coordinates there are acting in relation to my feet, <laughs> which is not exactly what you want in this situation. So you can fix this by using execute, and then we're using anchored, and we're anchoring to the eyes now. We're going to run set block with the same two block forward and using glass, and that's more reasonable, isn't it? Next up are at and as. These change the position and the entity of the command context, respectively. So take a look at that creeper. Let's say we want to move him around a little we can use slash execute to do this better. Normally we might teleport him and use relative coordinates, but let's take a look at what that does. TP at E, and we're going to use type equals creeper uh, to teleport him over to me. So that's great and all, but what if I want to move him around relative to him? I can't do that myself because I'm not him, the relative coordinates don't reference him, but we can use the execute command to change the command context to his. So let's have an example here. Execute as at e type equals creeper, and on a related note, at s is something I'll get to in a moment because it's going to be useful. But in the meantime, what we've achieved here is the execute command will change the command context, the entity of the command context, to be the creeper, not me. However, this does not change the position of the command context. The relative position is still relative to me, because that's the position that the command was run from. However, given that we've selected the creeper as the 
executor of the command. We can then reference him with at s. If we then use the at sub command to change the position of the command context, at at s, then we can now teleport him in relation to himself. So let's run a tp command and use something boring. See, he gave a little hop there. So what we've done there is that we have selected him with as, as the executor of the command. We've used him as the entity in the command context. And then, given that he is the entity in the command context, we can easily reset the position of the command context in reference to the executor, which is now him. Then we run the tp command with that new position in mind. Now you may be wondering, well, that's a little overcomplicated. Why don't you just use at, at s, and run the tp command like that? Well, I'll give you a demo. <laughs> let's use execute at the creeper, and let's run tp. Oh wait, tp requires a selector. So who do we select now? Well, if I use at p, <laughs> foolishly, then that's going to teleport me to him. If I use at e type equals creeper again, then that will teleport every other creeper to every other creeper, which I'm not sure exactly how that'll end up working, but I assume that all the creepers would end up in the same place on one of the positions of one of the creepers. And if we type at s, well, you might think that's being clever, but again, I end up on the creeper, and that's because I'm the guy that executed the command, not the creeper. So that's why the as keyword was relevant earlier. On to facing. This one alters the rotation of the command context to be aligned towards a given block or entity or position. So let's type execute and facing. And you can see we've got the block positions or the entity position. And they're pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to use entity here because I've got a creeper over there. And this is the entity selector to which we will be pointing at e type equals creeper, and we will be pointing towards the eyes of the creeper, just for fun. And let's run a teleportation command in relation to the rotated position of the command context. So let's say five blocks. So this teleported me closer to the creeper, and it also altered my rotation to be pointing parallel to that same line. Now if we repeat the experiment without execute, and just use tp then, as you might expect, I teleport forwards, and indeed down a little. Now we're on to if and unless. I'm doing them as a pair because they're very similar. Unless is just the inversion of if. So let's type execute if, and we get here a bunch of options. So these are the different ways of using if to test conditions. The first one is block, and what this one does is it tests whether the block at a given position is a certain type of block. So if we use error here, then we can run a say command, and let's just say hi. So that says hi, because we're standing in error. Now, if we use a different block, say uh, glass, then we do not get hi, because the block is not glass. The next step is blocks, plural. What this one does is it tests a given volume of blocks against another. So let's have a little pattern here and I'll recreate it over here. So let's start this out with execute if blocks. We have a number of options here. You give it the starting corner of the reference volume, which is the one we're looking at here, and then you give it the finishing corner of the reference volume, which is that one, and then you give it the testing location. This is the start of a volume of the same dimensions, which is to be tested. We have now an option, all or masked. This allows us to ignore error blocks. I'll get to that in a minute. All, and then we're back to the option of a new subcommand, and we're going to use run say hi. And indeed it says hi. Now if we break that, it does not say hi, and that's because the volumes no longer match. If we break this block, and then we use masked, it does say hi, because it doesn't care what is in these error blocks now. What it cares about is that these bedrock blocks are in the correct location. So now it doesn't say hi, because these are required, but the error blocks can be whatever. This differs from all, in that with all, the error blocks are also required. Next up is data. This one checks to see whether or not the block, entity, or storage has data matching the given path. 
So we're going to take a brief excursion to the world of data and I'm going to use the storage data because it's cool, I didn't know about it before, and it's convenient. So let's use the data command to view the data that I've already set up. I can do that by using data get from storage. This is arbitrary NBT data storage. And this is the key that I've set up. And you can see it has custom two. So now let's use the execute if data to check that storage data. That's the key. And now we have to supply an NBT path. So there are a couple ways we can do this. If I type custom, then it's going to check to see if the storage data contains that path. So let's use the run say hi to view whether or not this works. And indeed it says hi. That's because custom is present in that storage data. If I use Bob, then we do not get a hi because there is no tag Bob. We can also check the value in the data by using a more verbose format. We need to specify the actual tag. So custom to run say hi, and we get hi. Now if we use custom one, we do not get hi. Next up is entity. This will check whether or not a certain entity exists. So if we use at e type equals creeper, and then our little testing hello, we can get a high message in chat. And then if we kill the creeper, no creeper exists, and we do not get a second high message. Next up is execute if predicate. Now this opens up a whole nother can of worms about how to declare a predicate in a data pack. But if you've managed to do that, then you can use if predicate to test whether or not that predicate is true. The predicate is run with the command context in mind. So execute allows you to modify this context before you run the predicate. So I've already prepared a couple predicates and I'm going to use has hat to check whether or not I have a suitable hat on. Here's the predicate that I'm going to be testing, but I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of this stuff in this video. So now that we've specified the resource location of that predicate, we can run our testing hello, yes, helpo. And since I don't have a hat on, it didn't say hello. Now that I have a hat on, it does say. And finally, score. So this one allows you to check the score of a certain entity on a certain objective in the scoreboard. Now here I'm going to be checking myself, my score, in custom, which is an objective I've already set up, and my score in it is zero at the moment. Now we have a number of options here, and it would seem that the first set allow you to check whether or not the score is less than a certain value, or less than or equal to, or greater, etc. But in reality, these things are for comparisons across different scores, and so they work slightly differently than you might expect. So let's use one of these first ones to check my score in custom, which is zero, in relation to my score in other, which is another objective I've set up, and my score in other is two. So this should run the say command because zero is less than two. And there you go. Now, if you want to compare in relation to a concrete value rather than another score, you need to use matches. We can check whether or not it's exactly matching with a single digit, so that's zero in this case, which gives us high because my score is indeed zero. Alternatively, since this number is actually a range rather than a single value, I can use the range notation to check, for example, whether or not my score is less than three. And indeed, we get high because it is less than three. If we say greater than three, then no high appears because it is not. As I mentioned before, unless is a simple inversion of if. Finally, we move on from if onto in. This modifies the command context's dimension. For example, we can type execute in the nether to run a TP command of the closest player to the position of the command context. And we switch dimensions here. <laughs> and enjoy falling out of the world because of how low down we were in the previous dimension. Next we have positioned and rotated, which shockingly alter the position and rotation of the command context. Positioned has two options. The first one is as, which uses the position of a given entity, say a creeper. There you go. That used the position of the creeper as the position of the command context. The other option is a three-dimensional position, and so the same test yields the same results. 
The sub command rotated works very similarly to positioned. It has the options for as, to use the rotation of a given entity, for example a creeper. You can see I moved forwards in relation to the creeper's facing direction, rather than my own there. Alternatively, you can use a fixed two-dimensional rotational coordinate. The subcommands in, positioned, and rotated differ from the subcommand at by not setting all of those things at once. Finally, we have store. This one can be used to store the result or success of another command into some container, so some kind of tile entity that has a data structure, or a boss bar's maximum or current value, or an entity's data, or a scoreboard value, or storage. Again, this time I'm going to be using storage because it's convenient. So a command that has been run has a result value and a success value. The result might be something like a data value fetched from storage. The success value is either 0 or 1 depending on whether or not the command succeeded. Now before I get into this demonstration, I have two storage data locations. The first one is custom data, which holds 2.5d, which means 2.5 as a double. And then my second one is custom store, which has zero. So let's use the execute command, execute store, and we want to store the result into arbitrary storage. And I'm going to try and transfer custom data's value into custom store. So my storage location is going to be custom store, and I'm going to be storing it in custom. This is the path. As I do this, you should note that although I'm using storage here, instead of block or entity. The block and entity versions also require a data path, so it's, it's going to be a similar process for them. So next we get to choose a data type. This seems all very well and good. I want to transfer a double, I want to store a double. The problem here is that the result of the command is rounded down before it ever gets to the store subcommand. And so despite my wanting to transfer 2.5d into the other storage location, I'm only going to be able to transfer 2 as an integer, even if I store it as a double afterwards, which is a funny limitation really. In any case, the next value is a scalar. Once the thing's been rounded down, it'll be multiplied by this value, and since I just want the value, I'll pick a scale of 1. So now we're back to execute, and I want to run the data command to get that value from storage, and it's stored in custom data under the custom tag, and if we run that it helpfully spits out the result of that command. Now, that's the textual result. The result that was passed to the execute command is unfortunately different. If we run one of the data get commands again, you can see we have two. So that's a bit of a bummer, really. However, that is how the store subcommand works. Now, the store subcommand is really useful in other situations. But if you wanted to modify this data in a more flexible way, in this particular situation, I would suggest using data modify storage into store custom and set the value from <laughs> storage custom data custom. And then we can view a 2.5 in there. So that one takes the value directly from the other data and puts it into the new set while well, the execute command has that weird rounding thing going on during the transfer. So that's how you use all the different pieces of slash execute to modify the command context of a command, to modify whether it runs or not, and to do stuff with the result of the command. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments section, but that'll be it for today. So hopefully this video was useful and I will see you in the next one. Take care and bye-bye.